Hi, you're listening to Marsha Pally and conversations I'm having with people about the criteria we should use to design and implement our economic and political policies. What should be our basic framework for determining public policy? These conversations are based on ideas from a book of mine, Commonwealth and Covenant, Economics, Politics, and Theologies of Relationality, because we're looking specifically at relationality as this framework for policy. Relationality includes both the individual person and the relations and contexts that he or she is in. Relationality is developed in many of our philosophical traditions and also in several theological traditions. Whether you think theologies are the word of the divine or an illuminating metaphor, in both cases they offer us much about how the world and people work and so about the policies that will lead to the greatest human flourishing. Please join us in this series of conversations. Commonwealth and Covenant was published by Erdman's Press in 2016. You can follow me at marshapally.com or search for me on Facebook and Twitter. The theological discussion of these principles is between two and three thousand years old. And so we're going to start with them. It uh, starts with a note about interpretation. When we talk about theological voice, we are talking about looking at um, faith traditions and their texts. And, have, and as soon as you have texts, you have the question of how they are being interpreted. Some people think the faith tradition texts are the word of God. Some people think they are human but inspired by God. Some people think they have nothing to do with God. They're simply an illuminating metaphor. In all of these cases, one, we might be able to learn something from them. Two, we have to interpret them. Whether you think it's the word of God or a human endeavor that is, enlight that is enlightened and we have something to learn from, you still have to interpret it. And as you know, any text has multiple interpretations. Have a look at, the, at any of the sacred texts and how they have been interpreted over time in different places. This is why we have such large secondary literature about, for example, the Bible. Because people have been interpreting the Bible for 2,000 years, at least. Yeah? And you will notice the interpretations differ from time to time and place to place. So what do we do with the idea of multiplicity and interpretation? The position taken by our relational theologies is that there are things that are true about the world. It is not a relativist position, everything goes. But rather, there are true things about the world, excuse me, some of which are found in our faith traditions. And the way we get to what's true about the world is through the accumulation of our ideas about that, about it, or about, I guess, about the world. Multiplicity of thought, multiplicity of ideas, leads to a more accurate understanding of the world. Um, so when we talk about sacred texts, you will notice that I will be quoting and Commonwealth and Covenant draws, Commonwealth and Covenant, excuse me, <clears throat> draws on a great many voices from a great many faith traditions in order to try to enrich our understanding of our relational setup. Because no one alone really gets at the whole thing. To underscore this point, I just want to go through a few um, people who have made it to go through their quotes. For, um, <clears throat> for example, General George Patton, not normally known as a theologian, has said one of my favorite uh, comments on this 
If everybody is thinking alike, then somebody isn't thinking. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, multiple approaches may tell us what is correct, but it also helps us identify ideas that are incorrect because you have multiple approaches. So you can compare and think about different interpretations. David Kramer of the Jewish Theological Seminary notes that what we have of the divine is in texts which require interpretation. And he writes, this was and remains a profoundly human activity. Humans are, by definition, imperfect. It is this that distinguishes them from God. Human interpretations must also therefore be imperfect, and even on frequent occasions perhaps wrong. We can get it wrong when we interpret scripture. Right? And perhaps with further study, we will correct ourselves, or perhaps by comparing with other people's study. <coughs> Multiplicity itself is one way each perspective or each faith tradition self-corrects and deepens. Chief Rabbi of the United Hebrew Congregations of the, of the Commonwealth, that's the UK, Lord Jonathan Sachs, writes, truth emerges from the quite different process of letting our world be enlarged by the presence of others who think, act, and interpret reality in ways radically different from our own. That's how you get it. I want to also note that on the theological view, to claim that you have complete truth is <coughs> not only inaccurate, it is self-divination and idolatry. You have com complete truth would be establishing yourself as the divine, as knowing all perspectives and all possible perspectives past and future this is a form of idolatry, self-worship. Instead, I think we have to content ourselves with certain epistemological humility, humility about our understanding, with the possibility that quite different positions will be right, or some will be righter than our own, and that our beliefs will be confirmed over time, or falsified over time, or amended, and importantly, that aporia or fundamental contradictions that we think are contradictions today will be resolved in the future in ways that we cannot yet configure. Remember that um, argument about whether light was a wave or a particle? And there were, yeah, there were schools of thought that thought it was a wave and schools of scientists who thought it was a particle and they argued for a long time. And it turns out that that's com a completely wrong binary to be working with. Right? Fundamental contradictions or aporia might be resolved in the future in ways we can't imagine today. Was Jesus the son of God? Christians think yes. Hindus, not so much. Muslims, not so much. Yeah? But there may be aporia in faith traditions that would be resolved in ways we do not, cannot even imagine today. We don't yet have the categories of the resolution. Hmm. Um, and this, this is the perspective about interpretation and why as we continue we're going to hear the voices of many different, um, of many different thinkers, philosophers, theologians from many different traditions. We're trying to enrich our understanding from the multiplicity. Yeah. Yeah, I also think this, this is a basic scene of science and of uh, like, like empirical work and theoretical work that you that you have um, more than one opinion and you bring it together. And it's like, so there's a link between theology and the um, modern science. Human beings come to know things, anything, mm. um, in the way you've described. You have, you have different, I don't even want to say competing ideas, because not all of them are competing, right? We have different ideas and different emphases and different approaches. Some of them are close, some of them look contradictory, and you have to work with that. That's how you get a better understanding of what's going on. Can we yeah. call it brainstorming? Yeah, 
Right. It's a kind of brainstorm. It's kind of long-term millennial brainstorming of the human race. Yeah. It's a, it's a new competence that, that they teach in the intercultural the competences that it's called the um, ambiguity tolerance. And uh, it comes, uh, from what I've learned, it can, we can come from the good and bad world of the communist and the capitalist, the two blocks was, which, which separated our world into easy systems. And it was easy, one was wrong and one was right. And then the wall came down and everybody was right and wrong. All of a sudden it got very scary. And I think uh, with, also with the development of the internet, it became all very unmanageable. And we all have been challenged in, in accepting that things can be both right and wrong, which is quite terrifying. It was easier before. When I grew up, it was easier. Things were right or wrong. But I mean, the communists were bad and the capitalists were good. It was really easy. But it's not that easy anymore. There's a wonderful line in one of the James Bond films where Judy Dench playing M, she, uh, it's a post-Cold War James Bond film, she's walking down the hall complaining to one of her colleagues and so she says, oh, I miss the Cold War. It was so <laughs> simple, right? Um, yes, but life isn't like that, right? It's, uh, yeah, yeah. But it's interesting how we very much needed that time after, I guess, after World War II, how much the world needed this, this very, maybe to reconstruct, maybe, or exit for the West, I mean, maybe to, to, to develop, I don't know what. I, can I just say one more thing? I tell just one more, because I, I saw this movie called The Act of Killing, I don't know if anybody has seen it, from Joshua Oppenheimer, he's an American Danish, uh, 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 is that what you director, it's a documentary, and he was invited to go to Indonesia in 2003, and was um, for some, for some project, and realized that there had been a genocide in 1965, and that um, the people who had committed the genocide against the communists, like killed one million people, with the machete mostly, were still in power. So there had been no working on the genocide, and he decided, and he, the, so some of the survivors who had to live in the same village, as the people who killed their parents or brothers or sisters or and there had been no working and they were still in power. And so the, some of the survivors asked him to make a documentary and he, uh, he made two documentaries, one on the perpetrators and one on the survivors that were both nominated for an Oscar for the documentary and uh, he, uh, the first uh, movie on the um, on the perpetrator, was very moving because he said he could only get to them if he considered them not as, as monsters, as what they were, but as human beings. He could only um, make a movie that had anything to say if you approached them as, as people. And let's have a look now at some of the theology behind that, Julia. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to start here um, with this um, with the basics. We're going to start with the basics. The basics of theology of relationality, this time in theological voice, um, so that we can understand how the theological <coughs> voice uh, expresses and describes our separateness, our distinction, our uniqueness, and our situatedness in reciprocal impact. So it begins with this. Um, all beings come to be, all human beings as well as all beings, come to be by partaking of the source of being, God, in theological voice. The reason why is there anything at all, the reason that there is something more than nothing. And the reason why there are the particular things that there are. We must partake of, metaphorically, we must have in us, we've spoken about this before, something of the source of being God in order to exist, otherwise we wouldn't exist. Richard Taylor gets at this in his story about a man who's out for a walk and comes upon a large translucent sphere in the middle of the woods. He would naturally wonder why it is there and how it got there. 
questions that should be asked, Richard Taylor notes, about anything at all and about everything we come upon. What is it? Why is it here? How did it get there? The answer, Ian Barber suggests, is something like the structuring cause of unfolding possibilities, or a designer of a self-organizing process. Remember, nature is a self-organizing process, but what's the whatever that is the reason that there is the nature that we have? Or something you could call the cause of causes, or the condition for what is now and what may become. This idea of the, of the cause of causes, structuring cause, amends the emanationist theory of the third century philosopher Plotinus. Plotinus held that the universe comes forth or emanates from the one source of all being. Now this idea was very attractive to uh, theologians in the Abrahamic traditions, but it was also problematic because his description of automaticity means that emanating from the one source is automatic, sort of mechanistic. The one, it just happens mechanically. Um, and for Ab the Abrahamic traditions, therefore you have, um, you, you have a mechanistic model of the one source, God. And that doesn't, that disturbed Abrahamic theologians. And this was addressed first by Ibn Sina, one of the great medieval Muslim philosophers, who said, look, everything that is has being and particular features. They have existence and essence. But the one source of everything doesn't have these two things. In the one source of everything, it is all one. That and that this one source, this is the idea of divine, the Islamic di the <coughs> idea of divine unity or tawhid. Maimonides, the medieval Jewish philosopher, and Aquinas, the medieval Catholic philosopher, concurred and developed this idea. Since God is the oneness of being <coughs> itself, and all possible characteristics of being that there are or might become. God self-expresses being and particular characteristics that change from time to time. I'll say that again. Because God is the unity of being itself and all possible characteristics and features of everything that might, there might ever be, God, the reason and source for everything, itself expresses from this source existence and particular characteristics. Now, you don't have all possible characteristics. You have the few thousand that make you who you are. And that's true of each one of us, and it's true of this water bottle, and so on. Um, we have particular characteristics as well as something of being itself in order to be. Whereas the source of everything has all possible characteristics in a unity with being itself. And this idea developed through the thought of Ibn Sina, Maimonides, and Aquinas. While Aristotle had seen the universe's basis as whatever exists in itself, it in Sinem, Maimonides, and Aquinas saw the world as partaking of the one source that self unfolds being and differentiated beings. And the one source is the only entity that can self unfold existence itself and differentiated beings with a subset of characteristics of all the possible characteristics that there can ever be. But we have religious communities, for example, and this is, this is a kind of uh, completing circle, maybe? Uh, 
You know, I think that, yes, if, if you have the idea that you are reciprocally responsible for others and that you are in layers of relations, uh, nonetheless, I, that doesn't mean that if you have a religious community that you become God who has all characteristics. Um, you, just like, as we said with interpretation of texts, you may gain a much richer and more uh, complete view of life from um, understanding yourself and understanding other selves around you and other beings and even perspectives that are quite far from your own. But none of us will become the ground for everything, no matter how many people we talk to, so to speak. Is that? Okay. So if we move on from this basis, that's the beginning description of the one source, the cause of causes, the structure of cause. It's a self-unfolding of being and differentiated beings. That's us, the differentiated beings. In Aquinas' words, the very existence of creatures is to be related to their creator. Our existence is, we, uh, is being in relation to the source of existence. How else would we be? How else would we come to exist if we had no relation to the source of, uh, of existence? Said another way, as a condition of being at all, humanity partakes of the source of all existence and differentiation. Humanity, each one of us, partakes of the source of existence and differentiation in order to be. Or more poetically, you can say, we are in God's image. On one hand, we partake of the one source of being in order to exist at all. Yet this source is radically distinct and different from us. So we partake of it, but it is radically different. While it self-expresses, it remains radically other. So we partake of a source. <coughs> we are in a partake partaking relationship to a source that is ever distinct and different from us. This fact of distinction, we are always separate and distinct from the source of all. Yet, we are in a partaking relationship in the source of all. We are distinct and yet in relation. That's the way anything comes to be. That is the condition of existence. The structure of being, the structure of existing at all, is distinction and relation. To begin with, it's distinction from the source of being and yet intimate relation to the source of being. Otherwise, you wouldn't be. But it turns out that it, but this is as the structure of existence, it means that all of our existences is distinction amid relation. 